Hello everyone and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I want to look at one of the kind of premier poets and writers of the early 18th century, Jonathan Swift. And in particular I want to look at one of Swift's poems. I think Swift is such an interesting figure to look at and to study and to read. Um, but he can be, I think, quite difficult to understand in terms of tone and meaning because he uses satire and he uses irony, but he also uses double irony, which is a kind of ironization of irony. So it can be quite difficult to understand where he's being sincere, if he's not being sincere, or how we we're to kind of interpret um, the, the, the meaning of the poem because the tone can sometimes be quite slippery. So today I'm, I want to look at an extract from a poem and look at how form informs the meaning. So not so much looking at the content um, of the words, although obviously that's very important when it comes to understanding meaning, but thinking about how the content, the content interacts with the form. And I'm going to think about this in um, in two ways. I'm going to begin by looking at rhythm and metre and then I'm going to move on and look at the structure, the overall structure of the whole verse paragraph, the whole extract that I'm going to be looking at. And the poem from uh, by Jonathan Swift that I'm going to focus on is called Verses on the Death of Dr Swift, written by himself. And it was published in 1739. So already it's it's slightly odd um, just from from the title and that's written on the title page. Um, so it's a kind of mock or pseudo elegy. It's about his death, but written by himself. It's obviously a kind of impossibility. So it's a, a kind of intellectual game that he's he's playing. Um, so it's written by Jonathan Swift, imagining what will be written about him after he dies. So a kind of self obituary. And he has a line within the poem itself. Now Grub Street wits are all employed with elegies. The town is cloyed. So. Usually. Uh, with an elegy. It's a, a, a lyric, so it has a kind of classical uh, Greek, um, it's been inherited and it has that kind of classical authority. Um, and it's usually one that laments the death of a friend or a public figure. And the tone is usually respectful, grave, sorrowful, but sort of at the same time celebrating the life, you know, a kind of a eulogy, we might say. Um, but not so for Swift within the poem. So now Grub Street and Grub Street is a kind of metonym for hack writers. So if you if you talk about Grub Street, you're talking about all the writers who uh, whose offices are on Grub Street, which is a kind of lowest type of journalistic uh, writing. So if you ever see Grub Street in 18th century writing, that's what it means. And it's a great sort of evocative <laughs> image, Grub Street, you know, all the little grubs grubbing around in the dirt trying to write these um, write these stories. Now, Grub Street wits are all employed with elegies. The town is cloyed. So we've got a kind of mixture of the high form, the elegy, which you might think of as being serious and, uh, you know, a, 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 a sort of high uh, literary form. Um, but we've got the image of that sort of mixed in with the image of low Grub Street. And you can see that kind of inherently with it within the, the lines as well in that you might think it's a, a good thing if you say lots of elegies have been written about someone after they've died because it suggests that they've lived a life which has affected lots of people in a very positive way and they've written these very positive, lovely, sorrowful, plaintive, grave, respectful but celebratory elegies after this poem's after this poet's after this person has died, sorry. Um, 
But Swift isn't doing that. He's saying, yeah, there are loads of elegies everywhere, but they're not written because people are, want to celebrate my life particularly. It's because all these Grub Street writers are just trying to find employment. So they're churning out these cloying um, elegies, um, which aren't really anything to do with me particularly. They're about these Grub Street writers having employment. Um, so the tone is already kind of uh, topsy-turvy and a bit confused and a bit difficult to assess. So as I've said, the poem was published in 1739, but written um, years earlier in 1731. Swift wouldn't go on to, to die until 1745. So in 1731, Swift wrote to his good friend, John Gay. I have been several months writing near 500 lines on a pleasant subject, only to tell what my friends and enemies will say on me after I am dead. So this kind of imaginative speculation is for Swift a pleasant subject. And I think that's an interesting thing to kind of hold on to when you're looking at the way that Swift engages with his enemies, that he finds that a pleasant subject to think about what his enemies will say about him. And of course, we, it's difficult to assess the tone of, of a letter like this too. Um, but I, I think we can, we can sort of see that in the way that Swift does engage with his um, enemies, that kind of enjoyment in the antagonism. So I think this is a useful phrase to hang on to. Um, so Swift here talks about his friends and what they will say um, about him. Um, and the people that appear in the poem are John Gay, so who, the man who is writing to, who you may have heard of um, as the author of The Beggar's Opera. And others include John Arbuthnot, so he's the same figure that Pope writes the poem Epistle to Arbuthnot about, um, who was mainly um, a physician but did also write and he wrote, for example, or he, he came up with the character of John Bull, who is kind of still sometimes used as a, um, a kind of caricature of Britishness. Um, and of course, Alexander Pope, uh, who was the um, preeminent poem, uh, poet of the period, and who uh, is the figure who appears in the passage that I'm going to be uh, looking at and examining today. So all these mem are people, are members of the Scribblerous Club as it's called, Gay, Arbuthnot, Pope, Swift. And the Scribblerous Club was a kind of literary group who came together. They shared sort of some political ideas, but also really they shared uh, an interest in satirising what they saw as the kind of corrupt, contemptible political and literary scene of the time. Um, and so with Swift, you might think of A Modest Proposal, you might think of um, Gulliver's Travels, um, but also obviously, of course, in, in very much in the figure of John Bull, this sort of um, satirical caricature of Britishness, who I was mentioning, um, who John Arbuthnot, another member of the Scribblerous Club, created. And of course, in Pope's The Dunciad um, and so on. So these uh, friends, are members of the Scribblerous Club, who he's, you know, speculating the pleasant subject, he's speculating on what his friends might say about him after he died. But as well as his friends, he also considers it, as I've said, pleasant subject to speculate on what his enemies might say about him. And this, again, this may seem kind of perverse and topsy-turvy, but I do think it's a good way to try and think about understanding Swift's position and kind of engagement with what he sees as not only enemies in terms of people, but also opposing ideas. So, um, you know, ideas that he doesn't really believe in or doesn't, um, he thinks of as sort of enemy ideas, if that if that makes any sense as an image. Um, so in A Modest Proposal, for example, the the character who is the, the gentleman who's putting forward the proposal, which is that you know, it's a sensible thing for the poor in Ireland to start eating their own children. Um, the, the, that is obviously a kind of enemy idea, and yet the way that he, Swift, plays with it and kind of engages with it, um, the way that Swift is engaging and playing with that idea sort of suggests that he's enjoying 
that, uh, enjoying taking on that thought, um, enjoying that kind of antagonistic relationship with others. And I, and as I've said, helps us better understand uh, Swift satire and this kind of deliberately antagonistic, deliberately kind of provocative stance. Just before I get into delving into the kind of details of the extract, do remember if you like my channel, do please subscribe so you can see my videos when they're uploaded weekly. So the extract, as I've said, concerns Jonathan Swift's great literary friend, Alexander Pope, the preeminent poet, the premier poet of the literary age in which they were writing, which is the neoclassical uh, age, sometimes called the Augustan age. And um, he wrote poems such as The Rape of the Lock, which is perhaps his, his, most, his most famous and very, very celebrated poem. Um, but also others like Eloise de Abelard, which I think is a beautiful poem, but also kind of revolutionary in the ways that Pope uh, thinks about what uh, the form that he's writing can do. The epistolary letter form epistle. Um, but also uh, he, he wrote the essay on criticism. Um, which is a kind of marvellous uh, tour de force poem. Um, and so many kind of aphorisms come from an essay on criticism. So many of Pope's phrases that we think of, to err is human, to forgive divine, only uh, falls rush in where angels fear to tread. There are many like that, uh, that that have kind of seeped into our language, which come from an essay on criticism, very tight, very edited, uh, very wrought phrases, which will... Uh, come in and we'll see it being um, useful to think about later when we look at the extract in particular. So back then to Jonathan Swift. So this is one verse paragraph from Verses on the Death of Dr Swift written by himself. Vain humankind, fantastic race, thy various follies who can trace, self-love, ambition, envy, pride, their empire in our hearts divide. Give others riches, power and station, tis all on me a usurpation. I have no title to aspire, yet when you sink, I seem the higher. In Pope, I cannot read a line, so that's Alexander Pope. In Pope, I cannot read a line, but with a sigh, I wish it mine. When he can in one couplet fix more sense than I can do in six, it gives me such a jealous fit. I cry, pox take him and his wit. So the extract is one whole verse paragraph, as it's called. So a, a verse paragraph operates in the same way as a prose paragraph. So in, in normal kind of everyday prose writing, which is that each paragraph is supposed to contain one subject, one thought, one point, and then at the end of a paragraph, when you've kind of concluded your point, you move on and you have another paragraph. And as in uh, prose paragraphs, uh, paragraphs can be of different lengths. It's it you take as long as you need to to conclude your point or um, to to round off what it was that you were going to say. So a verse paragraph is different from a stanza. So in poetry, a stanza is a verse which shares the same the same form throughout the poem. So each stanza has the same structure, the same meter, the same rhyme scheme as each other verse in the poem. And there are many, many, many examples uh, of that. I mean, the Romantics particularly. Um, in John Keats, you know, you can think of uh, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, for example, or, um, oh, it's gone out of my head, the Eve St. Agnes or, or whatever. But there are many, many, many examples where all through the poem, you, it's divided off into stanzas, into these forms, which are the same throughout the whole poem. But the swift extract here is one verse paragraph. So... It should be, it should contain one thought, one subject, one point. But it's apparently not 
one subject because it seems when you first read it to be fairly uh, fairly broken into two sections so the first on vain humankind more generally and then the second on Alexander Pope and those seem disparate they seem to, to be disconnected from each other but by looking at other aspects of form so starting with rhythm and meter and then moving on to look at the whole structure of the verse paragraph we can understand a bit more about this verse paragraph's meaning and how actually the two apparently divergent halves might then be read as a whole unit how the meaning of one might inform the other let's start then by looking at the form of the poem so it's formal qualities so at the end of each line here we can see that there is a rhyme race trace pride divide station usurpation aspire higher my line mine fix six fit wit so can you guess well it's obviously in rhymed pairs but it's not in heroic couplets so what are heroic couplets then well heroic couplets are rhymed pairs of lines which we've we've got um, but they're rhymed pairs of lines in iambic pentameter iambic pentameter means that there are 10 beats per line so an iam is a foot and pentameter means five rhythm um, pent meaning five so if you think of a, 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 a pentagon it's a five-sided shape so you have ten beats per line then because a foot counts as two beats you've got a heel and a toe so in iambic pentameter you have heel toe 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 it's a bit of a tongue twister um, but you get the idea um, the 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 reason why they're called heroic couplets is because uh, the name sort of derives from epic poetry classical poetry which in the 18th century when heroic couplets as a form really dominated epic poetry was called often heroic poetry so it's linked with the kind of inheritance the neoclassical periods inheritance of um of that uh rhythm and you can see this for example in alexander pope's translations into english of epic poetry so his translation of homer's iliad for example is in heroic couplets and it was thought to have that kind of classical precedent um that kind of classical authority but that's why they're called heroic rather than epic couplets or, or classic couplets or whatever um iambic pentameter so as i was talking about the, the, the five rhythm um it's often seen as being a kind of natural english rhythm and it sort of suits or it's generally said to suit the way that english is kind of constructed or how it's been kind of passed down to us um and it has you know <laughs> kind of um canonical english literary authority so many of of william shakespeare's plays are written in iambic pentameter um as indeed is john milton's paradise lost which uh was a kind of incredibly important text uh, so paradise lost was written at the end of the 17th century and it you know kind of hangs over the um, beginning of the 18th century well into the end of the 18th century in the romantics for example who kind of I, adore Milton's Paradise Lost um, but but they both both uh, Shakespeare and Milton use iambic pentameter throughout their works and obviously given that they're kind of canonical for English literary history it makes sense that iambic pentameter kind of filters down into many other texts that are kind of seeking um, to to follow in that vein of course uh, they were generally speaking writing in blank verse rather than in rhymed couplets um, so they weren't writing in heroic couplets but they were writing in iambic pentameter 
So going back then to Swift not using heroic couplets in the extract we're looking at, Jonathan Swift does, however, elsewhere in other poetry use that form, use heroic couplets. So, for example, in a description of the morning. Now, hardly here and there a hackney coach appearing showed the ruddy morn's approach. Now Betty from her master's bed had flown and softly stole to discompose her own. So he's here using the kind of more, more natural sounding um, iambic pentameter, or in this case, heroic couplets, iambic pentameter. Um, and you can kind of, you can hear that, you know, now hardly here and there a hackney coach appearing showed the ruddy morn's approach. Now Betty from her master's bed had flown and softly stole to discompose her own. Obviously, it sounds a bit silly if you read it like that, but that, that sort of um, comforting, natural sounding underlying rhythm still persists, even if you, you, you make some <laughs> changes to some of the emphasis um, in terms of kind of intonation when you're reading. Um, and the heroic couplet, as I've sort of very, very briefly tried to explain, was really the dominant form in the period that Swift was writing, in part because it had, you know, had this kind of classical um, authority behind it. And this was, after all, a neoclassical period. But Swift does not use this natural sounding form in verses on the death of Dr. Swift. And I think it's really whenever uh, you are analysing a poem and the author uses a a, a rhythm that's kind of different from what they generally tend to use, I think it's worth it's worth pausing and thinking about why it is that they do that, particularly when they go against the very kind of dominant form of the period. Why doesn't he use heroic couplets? So instead, verses on the death of Dr. Swift largely uses iambic tetrameter. So tetra is the Greek for four. So instead of pentameter five rhythm, we've got tetrameter four rhythm, which means that there are eight beats in each line. So vain humankind, fantastic race, thy various follies who can trace of love, ambition, envy, pride, their empire in our hearts divide. Um, again, it sounds slightly odd when you read it like that, but you can see that the rhythm there is kind of pacey and upbeat. Um, and again, going back to what I was saying earlier about, about Swift's mixing of, of tones and why he's so kind of slippery to understand what he's trying to say, having a pacey and upbeat tone is slightly perverse, slightly odd for an elegy, which is supposed to be kind of sorrowful and serious. And yet we've got this kind of pacey, upbeat tone. What you'll also um, notice, though, is that some of the lines are not tetrameter. They're not um, eight beats. They have a kind of extra beat. So there are three lines in this first paragraph that have nine beats rather than eight. So give others riches, power and station. So that's got that extra shun at the end. Tis all on me a user patient. Yet when you sink, I seem the higher. So there are these three lines that are in this first paragraph that have a kind of extra beat in them. And this, you might say, is odd in two ways. First, of course, it contrasts to the eight beats, which has this kind of jolly rhythm that's bouncing along. Um, but you have to kind of stop slightly when you've got this extra beat to contend with. But also it's odd in that it's it's nine uh, beats rather than an even number of beats, so an odd number. And when you have an odd number of beats in a line, because we we want the kind of toe to come, if you're if you're thinking of heel toe, heel toe, heel toe, heel toe, heel toe, you want that final toe. Otherwise, it's kind of left hanging. It's it's slightly jarring. It sounds a bit odd if you go heel toe, heel toe, heel toe, heel toe, heel. You, you know, you sort of want that final, you want that final toe. So we've we've noticed then that these lines have an odd number of beats in them. And when you notice that when you're doing some close reading and you see that something doesn't fit into the pattern or seems a little bit odd or a bit jarring, or you think, oh, 
That's that's a bit interesting. That's a bit weird. Why is that like that? The thing to do then is always go, well, why is it like that? Why has the author decided to create this poem in this particular way? Why have they decided to make these lines have this odd number of beats in them? So let's look a little bit further at that now then. So um, usurp, so to usurp something means to take it over by by force. So when Swift says, tis all on me, a usurpation, he's talking about kind of encroachment, taking control. Um, and this is kind of on him, this external usurpation, this external kind of taking of control is put on him by these others. So give others riches, power and station. Tis all on me, a usurpation. So he feels that um, riches and power and station kind of encroach and take from him. You know, he's sort of apparently he's kind of giving it away. Give give powers, power and riches and station, so status to other people. You know, all it is to me is is a kind of feeling of taking and encroachment. And I have no need for that, actually. Whatever. Others can play those games. Others can be interested in riches, power and station. You know, I feel like it, it kind of oppresses me. It's an usurpation on me. Let others have it. Um, but then a few lines later, we've got yet when you sink, I seem the higher. So what we'll notice is that all the lines that have nine beats in them, so this extra odd beat, are lines that play on um, and engage with the, the theme of status and power. And that's kind of interesting. Uh, point to note, because again, you wouldn't have thought that that would be a subject for an elegy, really, to, to, to have this kind of um, rather grubby wrangling over riches, power and station. Although, of course, you know, you could say, well, there are many disputes about about wills and estates and so on and so forth. Um, kind of which might seem a bit sort of grubby, a bit, you know, a bit hack. Um, so Swift is kind of in some ways in this kind of mock pseudo elegy is kind of ironizing the very concept of the, the tone that's adopted within elegies um, because you know even in death there is still this um, contest over riches and power and status um, and control um, and who's higher and who sinks and who's lower etc. Um, and I want to draw your attention also to the word yet. So it's a in, really interesting word for, for Swift to include because it shows the inherent contradiction within Swift about and in relation to status and power. So on the one hand, he says, give, give others riches, power and station. It's nothing to me. And yet, when you sink, I seem to have a higher status. I seem to have more power. So he can kind of, on the one hand, want to say, get rid of power and riches and status. I don't care about any of it. It's just a kind of intolerable burden on me to worry about it. And yet, and yet, he kind of enjoys... But when you when you sink, when you get lower, it kind of naturally raises and makes me seem higher. So he he can't quite let go of it. He he still even though he he feels it's oppressive, uh, it feel he feels it oppressing him on the one hand. On the other hand, he he kind of enjoys feeling higher, feeling riches and power and status, and that that inherent contradiction in kind of hating something and yet 
being pleased with it or the kind of pleasant subject of dealing with your enemies. It's a similar kind of duality that's running through that feeling. He doesn't want to care about money and status and power on the one hand he feels it's a drain but on the other hand he just finds himself enjoying it when he feels slightly higher. So I now want to move on to the second aspect of form that I want to discuss when we're thinking about how form informs meaning and that's the overall structure of the whole verse paragraph, the whole extract. So the whole verse paragraph is divided into seven couplets and Swift draws readers' attentions to this very kind of specifically because he includes the word couplet. So it's sort of it's self-referential to the fact that he is writing a poem. He is writing a poem in couplets. And moreover, so he doesn't just draw attention to the fact that he's writing in couplets, but he mentions explicitly six. So six couplets. And this is so when you if you're doing some close reading yourself and you're reading a poem or something and you, you notice this kind of uh, incident, let us say, um, and it doesn't seem to be coincidence. So this seems very deliberate and particular for Swift to be drawing explicit attention to writing couplets and explicitly to six couplets just in the very kind of completion of the sixth couplet. If you notice that kind of thing, it's worth, as I've said, going a bit further with it and thinking, well, why has Swift or the author done that? You can see very, very particularly, particularly that six couplets is drawn explicit attention to in the rhyme, one couplet fix, I can do in six at the end of the sixth couplet. That doesn't seem to be coincidence. That seems to be deliberate. Why has Swift done that? So let's unpick it a bit more then. This sixth couplet comes in, as I was saying earlier, the half, or at least in the section of this first paragraph that's referring to Pope. And Pope, as I said, was known for his concise style that was that is very very highly wrought and edited so kind of technically brilliant and beautiful how he manages to convey meaning with almost all or very often extraneous words kind of completely excluded and pope talks about that in an essay on criticism he says you know you've got to get your uh, get your poetry rid of expletives as he calls them so those kind of words that that don't have any meaning that just pad out lines um and Swift is sort of drawing attention to that here as well. So if we look at a, a couplet of Pope's then, so from an essay on criticism, a very famous couplet, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the Pyrian spring. So the Pyrian spring is from, from Greek mythology. It's, it's a, an area that's sacred to the muses. It's a it's it, it's the Pyrian spring, a fountain of knowledge. So here in this one couplet, you've got quite a kind of profound thought about um, about how people kind of wield some sense of power, in this case, the power of learning and a little learning is a dangerous thing. And it, you know, it, it's 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 far better to drink deep from the fountain of knowledge or not to <laughs> drink at all from the fountain of knowledge. Either of those is preferable to drinking a little bit and then kind of wielding that power in a dangerous way, which, you know, it's a sort of interesting, profound thought from from Pope there in his couplet. Certainly, you can say that it, it's more profound, um, has more sense in it than the 
than Swift's couplet, when he can in one couplet fix more sense than I can do in six. I mean, it's funny and it, and it works in the context of the extract, but at the same time, it's not. A little learning is a dangerous thing. Drink deep or taste not the period in spring, you know, in terms of kind of complexity um, and and sense um, and fixing couplets, fixing in terms of, of organising them, of editing them, of managing them um, and so on. So in this couplet, then. Swift is kind of comparing himself and, and comparing him to to Pope when he can in one couplet fix more sense than I can do in six. In in using that six there at the end of the sixth couplet, Swift seems to be acknowledging Pope's superiority as a poet. So not just kind of saying it, not just saying, oh, with a sigh, I wish what he wrote was mine, but within within the form of his own poem, confirming that. Because because he's taken these these 12 lines, these six couplets, and he he is saying here and not really saying anything that Pope wouldn't be able to condense into one couplet only. So he's kind of mocking himself, you know, saying I've droned on for six couplets and I haven't really said anything um, as profound as Pope could do in just one couplet. So within this form within the structure within the way that it is set down the way that it's fixed there's a kind of joke in which swift acknowledges pope's superiority and kind of plays on it within the form of the poem so we've got up until the sixth couplet and then comes the seventh couplet it gives me such a jealous fit, I cry, pox, take him and his wit. So again, we've got this kind of internal inherent contradiction. So earlier I was talking about yet. So on the one hand, give others riches, power and station and yet, you know, when you go lower, I seem to be higher by comparison and the kind of enjoyment that, they ha that he has in that, in that yet, in that internal inherent contradiction and we see that kind of again here the the sincere acknowledgement of Pope's superiority as a poet in the in the form and yet it gives me such a jealous fit I cry pox take him and his wit it doesn't stop his jealousy so even as he could acknowledge that Pope's a superior poet he 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 still sort of um, enjoys the antagonism of saying, po you know, pox take him and his wit. He doesn't sort of say, isn't it lovely for my friend that he's a better poet than me? He says, ah, you know, he still feels the jealousy. He still feels that kind of competition. So in this case, it's not when you sink, I seem the higher. It's when you when you seem the higher, I seem to sink. Um, and that ties into what he was saying in the earlier lines of the extract. So even as he acknowledges Pope's superiority as a poet, it doesn't stop his jealousy, his self-love, his ambition, his envy, his pride, and thus his, and also his, his divided heart because he feels these two things, because he acknowledges Pope's superiority and yet he feels jealous that Pope is superior to him. The whole verse paragraph then exposes the inherent duality of the very opening exclamation, vain human kind exclamation mark. And Jonathan Swift includes himself in this as I, as I was talking about as is kind of exemplified through his relationship with Alexander Pope um, and Swift here is playing on the two meanings the kind of duality inherent within the word vain so the two meanings of vain um, so when he talks about vain humankind on the one hand he's talking about kind of vanity as we as we sort of straightforwardly understand vain um, which is you know, to have a very high self-love, um, 
in Swift's own words, to have a very high opinion of yourself and your worth and your ability um, and so on. But also there's a second meaning of vain, which is when something is in vain. So it's useless and pointless and empty. Um, you know, there's no sense of fulfillment. Um, it's, you know, instead, if anything, there's a, a sense of a failure of not being able to achieve something. So here we have humankind as vain in that they're, they're kind of pointless um, and empty. And he's Swift is in the whole kind of extract suggesting how how vain, how pointless jealousy and power status struggles actually are and yet so we have these kind of we have these vanities we want this power and riches and station and yet ultimately it's all in vain it's all it's all kind of pointless after after you're dead um so there's a, a kind of inherent satire an inherent duality an inherent kind of satirical condition of the human of humankind, of the human race, Swift included, he includes himself very much in this here, that one's feelings of vanity, one's self-love, ambition, envy, pride, as Swift talks about, that you have those, that one remains vain, even as one realises that ultimately one's vanity is all in vain. Thank you so much for listening. I do hope you found it useful. Um, remember, if you like uh, what I do here, then do please subscribe to my channel. It means that you'll see my videos when they're uploaded. Um, like the video, thumbs it up, and uh, do leave any comments or questions that you have in the comments below. I do love hearing from you.